counterfactuals, the recurring inaccuracies of movies and television. We've all seen them, and we all know what's wrong. But still, have you ever wanted to tell those would-be Mythbusters? Okay, I know this is incorrect. I understand it. I understand why. I get it. But what if it were real? What would change? How would it work? I don't know if you ask those questions, but I do. So I'm Katie Hoffman, and I invite you to join me in not only examining, but celebrating our counterfactuals. Dogs. Hmm. Can you remember a time when you didn't know what dogs were or what wagging tails meant? Oh, you're such a good boy. Yes, you are. Oh. Uh, neither can most filmmakers. It's kind of a regular thing in Hollywood that, except for the ones that were anthropomorphizing, all the animals act like dogs. And this really is kind of a logical thing to do. I mean, dogs have been our oldest domesticated animal and the one that works closest with us. So we understand their mannerisms pretty well. We're exposed to them early. It works. Most children know how to read a dog. They might not know how to read a horse. When we look at this horse, for example, we see that he's got his eye partially closed, his lip hanging. It looks like a pout, right? He's unhappy. He's annoyed. Not exactly. You see, when the horses close their eyes and dangle their bottom lip, that's relaxed and happy. That's the face that you'll get if you get just the right spot scratching their neck. It's a good face. But if you showed a cartoon horse making the real happy horse face to a child, they'd still think it was sad and it would be confusing for them. It would also waste a lot of time trying to teach us the right mannerisms for each animal instead of just going with ones we understood. So in all honesty, you can't be hard on Hollywood for this one. But hey, that doesn't mean that we can't explore it to the fullest. So what would it be like if animals did emote like dogs? Well, speaking just in terms of mammals, it's not quite as far-fetched as you might think. Oh, it's a stretch, but it's not the biggest stretch ever made. Throughout class mammalia, there's a lot of similar innervation going from the emotional centers of the brain into the face, vocal tract, and the more expressive body muscles. And this creates some extensive similarity in our emotional and pro-social behaviors. I mean, think about how you can walk up to most mammals and they will understand that stroking them, grooming them, or holding a paw, that that's a pro-social behavior. You're trying to bond with them. You're trying to comfort them. They get it. If you start crying out in distress, they know that that means distress because they do the same thing. So, not as huge a stretch as you think it is. Now, the behaviors still do differ a lot among species in the nuances, but we have a rough understanding of other mammals. Now, the thing about facial expressions, because that's where a lot of the huge differences come in. I mean, think about the horse. Yeah, we would understand that prancing around meant happy. We wouldn't understand that dangling the lip meant happy. So as far as facial expressions are concerned, yes, the innervation is fairly similar, but the individual muscles have evolved different shapes and different functions. So the same impulse coming down into these very different looking muscles, yes, it's going to get you a different movement. So in order for our mammals to have doggy facial expressions, give them more dog-like muscles and it might happen. However, there is a slight bump with this. Not all of our proto-dogs are mammals. I mean, we get a lizard, whatever kind of lizard Joanna is. I mean, McLeach calls her a salamander, but that's not a salamander. We have Madame Medusa's trained alligators. We have that one language-delayed dinosaur. Yeah. 
ponder those implications. And for the piece de resistance, we have our fetch-playing dead dinosaur. With our non-mammals, even if they did have the same musculature as a dog, or in some cases any musculature, the innervation would still be different. They don't have the same interaction between the emotional centers and the motor centers that dogs do. But here's the thing. All of these guys are so much more interactive and prosocial than they should ever be in the real world. And I'm not just talking about playing fetch or wagging tails. No, they not only are interested in the humans, they act like dogs with each other. Think of Medusa's gators. They don't ignore each other, they don't fight. They just pal around like two dogs who've been raised together. But why would it be that way? Well, the way that dogs emote, it's important for the communication in their social group. And if you think about it, the pack hierarchy that their ancestors, the wolves, have is actually rather involved. It's important that everyone be able to communicate clearly with everyone else, not just keep their eyes on you know, the male lion and understand what he wants. They have to understand everyone around them, especially when they're coordinating in order to hunt. So this is a big deal. And that cooperative tendency, as well as our similar diet, was why they bonded so well with humans. We wouldn't have been able to breed dogs to be as interactive as they are if they hadn't already had a fair bit of interactive tendency as wolves. So when we see these other animals that interact like dogs, it's not unreasonable to expect that they could be trained like dogs. And yes, even emote like dogs because that social structure is why those traits would have evolved. So, all right, we've taken the dogs from having that social structure to having a dog-like interaction with humans, maybe dog-like emoting, but why would they have that social structure to begin with? Well, in order to talk about this aspect of Hollywood biology, we have to talk about a um, less enjoyable and very misleading aspect of Hollywood biology. It's called Hollywood evolution. See, when you have a bunch of species that have the same trait, or at least two species, there are two main ways that it could have gotten there. So one way is that you have these two separate lineages all the way over here. One way is if two species who are already fairly distant in their lineage end up experiencing a similar selective pressure. Think of the human eyeball and the squid eyeball showing here. They do serve very similar functions and they have a very similar structure. Why? they meet a similar need. But if you look at them carefully, you'll see that there are a lot of major structural differences because they didn't come from the same place. They were created independently. So this is one way by which all of our animals could evolve a similar pack structure and behavior set. Because this is something that's shared among animals that are fairly close in their lineage and it's such a complicated thing to do. I'm going to suggest that we went by the second and far better known route, which is that this trait was present in ancestors and it got conserved all the way up the lineage. That's real world biology. Now, here's your last bit of real world biology, because after this we dive into Hollywood. There are things called evolutionary bottlenecks where there is some sort of catastrophic external change that massively whittles down the number of animals that are able to reproduce and pass on their traits. And it can happen to other things outside of animals too. But the thing about this is that it's usually random. There's usually just this disastrous thing and there's either no good solution and it's just random who lives and who dies 
Or there are many good options, like getting through whatever killed the dinosaurs. There were a lot of solutions. Hollywood evolutionary bottlenecks don't quite work that way. What you have instead is you have some undefined event, but the only way to get through it is to possess trait A. You must have this trait to live. And in our case, that trait would be the pack structure. So, oh, Hollywood. <sighs> All right, just, just ignore the Hollywood evolution. <clears throat> And even if all of the species who are descended from those few ancestors that were able to develop the pack structure and weirdly targeted Hollywood evolution, no, 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 stay on target. All right, some of those pack structures, yes, would probably be obliterated or altered due to genetic drift over the centuries or just changing environmental conditions. Well, the thing is, there is, trust me, no Hollywood movie in which we see every single species. Only the ones that are relevant to the plot. And, well, the ones that had this social structure and were more inclined to interact with humans, yeah, they would be the most likely to interact with our plot. So, I know that this was painfully bad, evolution. But the thing is, if we're going to embrace Hollywood zoology, we kind of have to be nice to Hollywood evolution. So let's just let it go and move on to the implications. <sighs> Our first implication involves one of those activities that we all think would be really cool. It's often super necessary in sort of a fantasy world. And looking at it, we really do think that it's easy. I am talking, of course, about horseback riding. Unfortunately, in our reality, guiding a horse is not as easy as it looks. Yes, you do handle the reins some, but the thing is, you don't do most of your riding from there, and if you try, you will piss the horse off. Like, really piss it off. What you really need to do is to guide the horse with your legs and your seat, sort of nudging them along, giving them direction and indicating how much faster they should be going and all these other things just through your legs and seat. It's hard, it's very hard, and it uses muscles that we don't normally use. So it takes a lot of time to not only not be walking like a penguin the next day, but to have enough control to really guide your horse. In contrast, when we watch these movies where the horses act like dogs, they don't really use their legs much. Instead, okay, they just sort of Let's see how fast give voice commands, point, and tug on the reins, and the horse does exactly what they want them to. Guess what? If I were riding a dog, that's how I'd ride a dog. And it's really cool, <laughs> really enviably cool, because this come. This kind of communication comes so naturally to us. It's so much easier to just give the horse a bunch of voice commands than to try to tell them little bitty things through your hips. It's so much easier and it really works well for characters who wouldn't have had much exposure to horses too. I mean, if you have this sort of sheltered character who would never have been exposed to a horse, it's okay, they can still ride. They give the voice commands, and if the horse likes them, it works. All is well. And I am deeply envious of that, because as it turns out, riding a real horse is a great deal more difficult. Really, really difficult. Well, talking of difficulty, there is of course a dark underbelly to this wonderful, wonderful counterfactual. And here it is. If all of these animals act like dogs, that means that our food animals act like dogs. That cow that you just ate for dinner, 
that was as intelligent and interactive and pro-social and interested in humans as your dog. You just basically ate a dog. How do you feel about that? Is it really okay to eat an animal that was willing to bond with you? Well, in a lot of Asian cultures, they don't make a fuss over it. It's just they eat everything. But we Westerners have the privilege to be a little squeamish. Actually, we have the privilege to be incredibly squeamish. Think about it. We don't like the idea of eating a horse. We abhor the idea of eating a dog. It, it would be like eating a member of your family. Why? They're bred to interact with us. They're bred to form bonds. They're bred to listen to us. If we eat our animal partners, it feels like we've betrayed them. We feel guilty. So how do you deal with that? Because while we would feel guilty at the same time in these movies, I'm not seeing a lot of ways that people could eat a vegetarian diet. You kind of have to eat meat. Well, what do you do? Fortunately, I suspect that our movie counterparts are about as smart as we are. And if they are, well, here's what I'd do if I were smart as we are in, I were in one of these situations. You see, we bred our animal partners, like dogs and horses, to be smarter, more interactive, more interested in humans. Why not do it in reverse with all our food animals, like cows, sheep? We could breed them to be less intelligent, less interested in us, just dumb as bricks so that we don't feel guilty eating them. But then the question becomes, is this kind of an absurd length to go to just to not feel guilty having a hamburger? We've put in that effort for stupider reasons. I'd say it's on the table. <laughs> pun. Bad pun. <sighs> However, the most important of all ramifications for this counterfactual, and probably the main reason it exists, any animal could be your best friend. I mean, think about it. We've all, when we were kids, said, oh, I want to have a panther. I want to have an alligator. I want to have an ostrich. Well, guess what? You can. You can. And even better, there are people who could seriously use the services of a dog, either for companionship or for assistance with disabilities, like being able to fetch stuff for someone who is paralyzed or wheelchair bound, or being able to, you know, provide visual and auditory assistance to someone. There's a lot of amazing stuff that we would kind of need a dog for, but some of those people who could really use a dog can't actually have one. Maybe they're allergic, maybe they have a phobia, which yes, can be a serious issue, at least as serious as allergies. Or maybe their housing doesn't allow it. You can't have a dog, but you kind of need a dog. That's okay. Have a lizard. Have a mongoose. Have a parrot. All of these could work. They would be just as attentive and loving and self-affirming and obedient and capable as your dog. And you could have them. Let's face it, that's why this trope exists, so that our heroes can have whatever animal we think would be cool, and it'll work. It'll listen to them. <sighs> Any pet you want, that is the reason to love this counterfactual. If you liked this video, please rate and subscribe, and also let me know in the comments if there are other counterfactuals that you'd like to see addressed. And uh, if you hated this video, hmm, oh, I know. I will pose pretentiously. And this way, you can print off a still and burn me an effigy. I feel completely justified in doing so. I hope this is pretentious enough. All right, I'm done. Print off a still and burn it if you want. Otherwise, I will see you back next time on Counterfactuals.